Uh, I want to welcome you again to Freedom Church International. It's good to have you here today, and uh, we welcome in those of you who are joining us online. We love that you tune in and take part in that way. We are in this series that we've been in for about a month now uh, that's about waiting on God, and today we're going to sort of turn the tables in terms of what we talk about today. Uh, we're going to talk about today the God who waits on us. If you've got your Bibles and your outlines, I want to invite you to just uh, pull those out and follow along. We're going to dive right into that now. You know, we have said again and again, and I'm going to say until we're done with this series, that the call of Scripture on us in every generation is the same, to be a people who wait on God. Every generation is called to the same thing. And we, we've said as we've searched the Scriptures that waiting on God isn't like just waiting on the doctor or the nurse to call you back. Waiting on God is different than watching the clock. Waiting on God is about finding a place of rest in total dependence on God, knowing that He's good, that He cares about you, and depending on Him in all things and leaning into His presence, knowing that God's solution for every problem that we have is what? It's more of His Son, Jesus. And so we're always leaning into Him. So we've been talking about this for about a month, all from our perspective. That our deal is that we need to be a people who wait on God. Well, today we're going to turn the attention sort of from us back to God and consider the other side of this equation, the reality that we wait on a God who is always waiting on us. So we're going to press into that for a few minutes today. As we start off in your outline, the first thing that we'll say is, is just that. Not only do we wait on God, but better still, God waits on us, which begs a question right off the bat, doesn't it? What's God waiting on? What is God waiting on us to do? Now, we said our waiting on God is about us learning to land in a place where we rest in total dependence on God. Obviously, when God waits on us, it's not that in reverse. God is not depending on us. He isn't dependent on us for anything at all. When God waits on us, it's more in the conventional sense of what we mean when we say we're waiting on something. God is literally waiting on us. Like, how much longer am I going to have to wait? But what is God waiting on from us? Well, God is, is waiting for us to turn our hearts and lives toward Him in faith, depending on Him, trusting Him, opening ourselves to receive what He wants to give. And what does He want to give? He wants to give a fuller revelation of Himself. He wants to give Himself to us in the relationship. And the first fill in the outline, God is always looking to bless and reward those who wait on him he's wanting to pour out what we need is what he's wanting to do and he's waiting for us to get out of the way so that he can do that isaiah 30 18 is the the one verse we're going to press into today and i want us to look at it in a couple of different translations the new king james says this therefore the lord will wait that he may be gracious to you let's let's read that again therefore the lord will wait why will he wait? That he may be gracious to you. Don't you want at that point to just go, well, just come on and bring it then. The Lord is waiting for the opportunity to be gracious to us. And therefore he will be exalted that he may have mercy on you. For the Lord is a God of justice. And here we see it again. Blessed are all those who wait for him. It's the two bookends. God is waiting on us and blessed are those who wait on God. Let's read it again in the NLT. It's a little easier to, to understand in that translation. So the Lord must wait for you to come to him so that he can show you his love and compassion. For the Lord is a faithful God. Blessed are those who wait for his help. This is the thing that, if there's just one thing that can happen today that would impact us, this is it. That we would catch a glimpse of the God who on the other end of this equation is longing he is waiting and longing to pour out everything that we need in greater abundance than we ever imagined like he is itching to do it the, the god who is over all things the god who created all things the god who has unlimited resources is chomping at the bits to lavish on us more than we ever imagined is possible on our end do you ever just pause to consider how much that picture gets warped and distorted and the perspective that we begin to have of God when we're in the middle of a circumstance where we're going, 
Why won't God give me what I need? Why won't God give me what I've asked for? Why won't God fix this relationship? Why won't God get me out of debt? Why won't God heal this person that I love and care so much about? Why won't God do the thing that we need for God to do? Is he mad? Is he busy? Does he just not care? Have I screwed up so badly that I'm just in God's doghouse that he doesn't hear my prayers anymore? What is broken in this relationship that God is so disinterested in me? Do you ever find yourself sort of sliding into those broken ways of thinking like there must be something wrong? Like I'm not praying right or I'm not right here or here because something has to be off. What we need is to catch a clear, fresh perspective of the reality that God's not mad. He doesn't have the volume turned down on on our cries to Him and our prayers to Him. That He is very attentive and He is very anxious to lavish on us everything that we need. If we can catch a glimpse of that, it will birth hope and faith and courage to press on and to press in. To position ourselves to receive what he really wants to do. And so that's really the thing that we're, we're diving into today. Is that recognizing that, that God is waiting and he is waiting with the longings of a father's heart. Everybody in the room that's a parent or a grandparent knows the weight of that statement. Everybody that's a mother or a father knows the joy of giving to your kids. Of taking care of your kids. And it's not like, it's not really like anything else in life, is it? That as a parent, nobody has to coach you up to want to give your kids what they need. I mean, it just gives you great joy and satisfaction to take care of your kids and to lavish good things on your kids. You you get what I'm talking about, don't you? I mean, it's just like, who had to ever train you to do that? It it was just wired into you. When that baby was born to you, every parent in the room knows nobody had to say, now we're going to begin the class on how to love a filthy baby that poops on itself all the time. We're not going to have to enroll you in that class. I, I still remember Whitney, my oldest, when she was born. You hear everybody talk about what a moving thing it is, and I was... Just kind of like, yeah, I'm sure it's special. I wasn't ready for what would happen in that moment. As gross and disgusting as it is, and I'm sorry, moms, it is gross and disgusting. I mean, y'all, y'all romanticize this. It's nasty. But it is still wonderful that moment when that baby arrives, and in the middle of all that yuck, all this emotion was, I cried like I was the baby in that moment when Whitney was born. The moment I first saw her face, I just couldn't stop the waterworks. As a parent, all this stuff that just suddenly is there. And it's like you go from being so self-centered to in an instant of time, I'll die for that child. That kid that doesn't even know who I am, I would lay down my life for that child. That's the love of a mother, the love of a father. And what God has for us is that kind of love that would do anything for us. Jesus told, and it's one of the all-time most beloved stories that he ever told. He told the perfect story to illustrate what we're talking about today. If you've got your Bibles, I want you to open with me to Luke 15. You already, If you've ever been in church much in your life, you've heard this story, you know this story, and yet it just never gets old. In Luke 15, if you were to start in the beginning of the chapter, the, the headings for the different sections of Luke 15 tell us that the first part of the chapter... Jesus tells about uh, the story of the recovery of the lost sheep. And then the next story in verse 8 is about the recovery of a lost coin. And then the next story is about the recovery of a lost son. Which is a great reminder that Jesus is all about seeking out and recovering what has been lost. That's good news because that's all of us. Nobody here was born right with God. We weren't born right at all. But Jesus has come to recover what's been lost. And so he tells this third and to me the most profound of the stories, beginning in verse 11. We call it the story of the what? What, What's the common title for this? The story of the prodigal son. I don't know anything else that we ever talk about in life that we use the word prodigal. But I would suggest that we've mislabeled the story It's the story of the prodigal father. 
which probably sounds weird because when we say prodigal, I don't know about you, but like since we don't use that word for anything else except this story, I always imagined, used to imagine that the word meant like bad or wayward, and it doesn't mean those things. I, I put it in your outline that, that the, the word prodigal means lavish, given in abundance, wastefully extravagant. Now we understand why the son gets labeled with that, but I would contend when you read this story, we're going to find that the father is more of a, of a prodigal than anybody, that he is so lavish in how he loves and gives. Like, he, he gives in a way that is wastefully extravagant. Let's read the story together. Jesus continued in verse 11, There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Now bear in mind... What this son is demanding is unthinkable. In first century Jewish culture, you would not do this because it's more than just impolite. It's horrible, unthinkable, because what you're saying is, you're dead to me, Dad. I mean, the only way you get your share of the estate is Dad has to die. This is essentially going, you're only worth one thing to me, and that is the loot that you have got. Give me mine, and we're done. We're not going to have anything else to do with each other. You might as well be dead. Surprisingly, the father gives him what he asked for. Not long after that, the son got together all that he had, and he set off for a distant country, and there he squandered his wealth in wild living. We don't have to use much imagination, but in case we aren't really clear how wild the older brother a little later in the story makes it clear really wild living he, he says you squandered all of your money on prostitutes you lived a wild life he was the party child he was the one that for a little while was a popular guy because you can bet he was the one to go hey everybody next round's on me yeah for a little while, he was a very popular guy. He had all the booze and all of the women that he wanted, and he went to a far-off place to do it because what he wanted was independence and freedom to live life on his own terms. And for a little while, he got exactly what he was after, total freedom. Didn't have to answer to Dad. Verse 14, after he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country, and he began to be in need. And most of us who feel like we've lived somewhat responsibly in our lives start feeling better about the story. Not like, uh-huh, uh-huh, now you're going to feel it, aren't you? You thought you had enough money to last you forever, but it's all gone now. And oopsie, bad time to run out of money because the foreign country that you ran off to is in a time of famine and the people around you are starving and you're about to join them. Verse 15, so he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to the fields, to his fields to feed pigs. And he longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. Now, on the surface of it, we get, okay, this is a bad time for this kid. But just for a moment, bear in mind, Jesus is a Jew talking to a Jewish audience. Now, there are two things you can know about Jews when they're hearing this story. They can't stand Gentiles. They're not supposed to have anything to do with Gentiles. You can't eat with them. You can't go in their house. You can't have anything to do with them. And this kid has run off to a Gentile nation, and he's so desperate. Now, he is not only having to have something to do with a Gentile, he has had to become the servant of a Gentile. The other thing you can know about Jews is they don't have anything to do with pigs. They would put pigs and Gentiles in the same category. Pigs are unclean. I mean, like, yeah, they're dirty, but they are, like, spiritually unclean. You can't touch them. You can't eat them. Don't have anything to do with pigs. And so Jesus is, like, rolling everything you can imagine into one ball. Pigs are filthy, and they are spiritually unclean. And this kid is at such a bad place, he has had to basically rent himself out to a Gentile to take care of his pigs. That is Jesus' way of spelling out rock bottom. For a first century Jew, you can't get any lower than this and still be alive. And if that's not enough, he longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. I mean, you got to figure Jesus is trying to not laugh out loud as he's telling that part of the story. Let me just say, you are hungry, 
When you're slopping the hogs and you're going, you know, that slop's looking pretty good. <laughs> Pigs eat some nasty stuff like what nobody else would ever consider eating, the stuff that is rotting. Well, what can we do with it? We can give it to the pigs. The pigs will eat it. And that kid's going, that don't look so bad to me. That is hungry. That is rock bottom. That's key to understand when you get to verse 17. When he came to his senses, and that's what we're all hoping happens in our lives. What we all hope will happen in the lives of those we love, our children, our grandchildren, our friends, that they will come to their senses. It didn't happen until he hit rock bottom. When he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have food to spare, and here I am starving to death. I'll set out, and I'll go back to my father and say to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you, and I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and went to his father. Now, don't think for a minute that this is just some little emotional manipulation that's going on here. He understands what he's done. He has declared to his dad, we're dead to each other. And so he understands he has no standing before his dad. But he does remember that my dad was a gracious man. And he was good to his servants. I could never be a son again. But maybe if I go back and I acknowledge what a horrible person I've been, Maybe my father would just let me be one of his servants because I know my father, even in lean times, would make sure that his servants had something to eat. So that's his plan. Got up and went back to his father. But in verse 20, while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. And he ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. And I am no longer worthy to be called your son. And he didn't make it any further in his well-rehearsed speech than that. His father cut him off. The father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. What a glorious, and if we're honest, shocking picture, isn't it? Put yourself in the story. If you're the daddy, how are you responding? I mean, at the very least, don't you have your arms crossed when your son comes back? Isn't there at least a moment of time where you're going, uh-huh, uh-huh? How'd that work out for you? You're looking pretty rough there, aren't you? Looking, looking like you lost a few pounds. Where'd your shoes go? Where'd your clothes go? There's some part of you that's wanting to go, I told you so. That's, that's how we would want to respond, isn't it? And yet the father in the story, Jesus is making the point that I'm, I'm giving you a picture of what God is like, the heavenly father. The father sees the son at a distance. Have you ever noticed the people that you are closest to, the ones that you really know and have known for years and years, that even in a situation where they may be far away, too far away, they're turned where you, you can't see their face, the light isn't good or whatever, but you see their walk. And it's like, oh, I know who that is. I know that walk. The son is that far away, but the father has been watching that walk for 20 years. And he doesn't wait for the son to get any closer he does something that you wouldn't do in first century culture, Jewish culture. Men did not run at all in public. It was considered a disgrace for a man to do that. But that father hiked up his robes and he took off trucking to get to his boy. That had to be a shock to the son. Like, has he ever seen his dad run as a grown man? Probably not. Like, if you're the son, aren't you thinking in that moment... This is either really good or really bad. <laughs> Dad is running my way. I don't know if it's to knock me out or what. 
And the dad gets there and he's trying to, he's like getting, probably getting sweaty palms and his heart's racing. And I've been rehearsing this thing. I've got to get it out for my dad. I don't even deserve to be your son. I, I want to just come and be your servant. And it's like he, he just can't even get it out because dad is just wrapping him up and putting a wet sloppy kiss on his cheek. And he's calling for his servants. And he doesn't just go say, hey, go, go find some clothes and put them. No, he goes, you find the best robe we've got. This isn't a poor man. Go find the best robe in our house. You bring and put the best robe on his dirty body. His feet are bare. Go get sandals for his feet. Don't let him take another step in these bare feet. And you go get the ring that says he's a son in this family. Don't you know the that he had been thinking, I, maybe I can be a servant. If I'm lucky, maybe one day he'll treat me like a stepson. No, put a ring on his finger so everybody will know that's my son. In fact, that calf we've been fattening up for one day for a feast, go ahead and kill that thing. Get ready because we are going to party tonight because the son that was lost that we didn't know if we'd ever see again, he has come home and I am so glad. It is a picture of ridiculous, over-the-top, lavish grace and generosity. Wouldn't you agree? I mean, isn't it... Don't give me a Sunday school answer. Isn't it crazy? You've been acting the fool. You spent all your inheritance. And you come home. He doesn't get a lecture. He doesn't get a time out. He gets hugs and kisses, the best robe, the ring, the sandals, and the party. What in the world was Jesus trying to teach us through this story? That God is your father. And as much as the enemy has tried to twist this narrative and tell you God doesn't love you, God is so disappointed in you, he isn't interested in your prayers. In fact, he's just waiting for the opportunity to take you to the woodshed. He knows about your screw-ups. He has not forgotten your stuff. He knows about all of your baggage, and he is waiting for the day. Ooh, karma is going to be terrible for you. You know the devil whispers those kind of lies in your ears. He does for all of us. And Jesus is just calling out the lie. It's bogus. God isn't looking for the opportunity to take you to the woodshed. He is the father in this story. He is just waiting. He is waiting for the day that off in the distance, he can see the one that he loves so much turning back in this direction. And he isn't going to stand back with his arms crossed and say, uh-huh, mm-hmm. Now you're going to have to pay the piper. No, he is running to meet us. That is the Father who is waiting on us. Now, just as an aside, it is worth pointing out what the Father did and did not do while the Son was off living as a rebel. What he did do and what he didn't do. Let's start with what he didn't do. When the son demanded what was his so he could go live like he wanted to live, the father didn't deny him. He let him go. He gave him his choice. Love always demands a choice. If there's not a choice, you can't really love. He gave him his freedom, and that's how God relates to us. He gives us the opportunity to love him or to reject him. He let him choose. He let him go. And the next part, some of us don't want to hear, but we need to let this sink in. He did not chase after him. He did not rescue him. He did not wire some money ahead when he heard times were getting lean in that country that his son had run off to. He didn't start wringing his hands and go, oh my goodness, we've got to get an apartment for the boy. We're going to have to make sure he's got plenty of food because he is my son. I mean, I can't let my son go hungry. I've got to make sure my son, I mean, we've got to get him a camel. I mean, he can't be going around on foot. We've got to make sure he's got a cell phone so we can stay in touch. I mean, he's been drinking a lot while he's been gone. We're going to have to pay for a rehab. We've got to get him in rehab. Where can we line him? What's the best one? We want to make sure he's in a comfortable one. He didn't do any of that. 
he let his son chase after those things for all he was worth, and he gave him room to experience what he wanted to do, life on his own terms, and the immediate consequences of those decisions. Why? Because he loved his son so much, and he was a wise father who understood he can't come to his senses until he's had the opportunity to hit rock bottom. Few, if any of us, ever come to our senses until we experience the pain of living life on our own terms. Somebody say amen or oh me. Maybe we need to say that again. We will not come to our senses, most of us, until we have experienced the pain of living life on our own terms. We've all tried it in different ways, but we've all been there, haven't we? It doesn't ever work out well, does it? Not for long. The father loved his son enough to know, as hard as it is to stay back and watch, I've got to let that happen. And when he comes to his senses and he turns and starts heading toward home, that's when I can raise my robe and start running toward him. It's a picture of the father who is waiting. Waiting means there are things he, he doesn't do yet. But even while he's waiting... What's he also doing? He's keeping his heart open. He's keeping his home open. He is staying in a place of loving his son as much as he ever has. And you can rest assured of this. Wherever you are right now, wherever you've been in the past, however far you think you have wandered from God, there's never been a moment where his love for you has ever wavered. Now, you may have gone through seasons, we've all gone through seasons, where we don't feel the nearness of God. Because the truth is, we have, just like the son, strayed from him. He didn't quit loving. He didn't quit keeping his heart open. We just don't feel him because we wandered. But he's waiting. Waiting with open arms. And that's good news, isn't it? Well, let's pivot for a moment here and ask the question. Just a practical question. If God wants to bless me, if God wants to lavish these things on me, why is it that when I do turn and begin to wait on God, begin to depend on God, why is it that he doesn't immediately give me the help that I seek, but oftentimes it seems like he makes me wait longer and longer? That's a fair question, isn't it? Because just as we have all strayed, most of us have also had times where in desperation or through inspiration or whatever, we turn back to God and we're just like all fired up and we're trusting Jesus and everything in my heart is yours, Jesus. So bless me good. And it doesn't just immediately come most of the time, does it? All the answers that we need and all of the solutions don't just all line up every time, do they? So why not? If God really is waiting to lavish good things on us, why don't we just always instantly get them the moment that we turn back to God? It's a good question. I want to just ask you to consider two of the reasons why this is the case. The first, as you follow along in your outlines, the first one is this, that even God cannot profitably gather fruit until it is ripe. What does that have to do with anything? Well, in James 5, 7, James says this, Dear brothers and sisters, be patient as you what? Yeah, nobody wanted to hear that this morning, did they? We better say that one again. Be patient as you wait. This is about waiting. Consider the farmers who patiently wait for the rains in the fall and the spring. They eagerly look for the valuable harvest to ripen. There's this idea here that a, a, a major part of the process is that there's, there are going to always be seasons of waiting. And a lot of times in waiting, he's, James says, you're going to have to be patient in your waiting because you're just like a farmer who has to wait for the crops to ripen or there's no value in harvesting them. He's teaching us a principle that God operates around, that there are things that cannot be done in a profitable way unless they're ripe, they're ready. I've always loved growing things. From the time I was a kid, we always had a garden, we always had fruit trees and stuff. 
And so I've always loved growing things, watching things grow and ripen. In fact, we went out, I, I got so much joy this weekend that we went out and bought a lime tree and a satsuma tree, and I got to plant them in my backyard. I love watching things grow and you know, for months watching stuff swell up and turn the right color and then eating what, what has grown. As a kid, my favorite thing to watch grow and ripen was we had a big thing of uh, scupnon vines in our backyard all the years that I was growing up, and I loved scupnons. And uh, I, every summer would be the same thing as a kid. You'd, you'd watch those clusters as they'd first appear, just tiny little specks, and they'd grow. And man, as the heat of the summer would stretch on out by, you know, late July and early August, they're just hanging there in these big clusters that, you know, look the size of grapes. And every, I'd have to, we'd have to walk past that all the time. And every time I'd walk by, I'd just be like, oh, I, I'm so ready to pick those. And every year I'd do the same thing. When they'd get full size, but they'd be green, I'm like, there's got to be some ripe ones somewhere in there. And in desperation, I'd always pick off a few green ones. I'm, I'm sure they'll be sweet enough. And you know what happens if you've ever eaten scupnons that aren't ripe yet? Same thing every time. For that to be such a sweet fruit, it is so nasty when it's green. You pop one in your mouth so expectant, and it's like, oh, you just wasted every one that you picked. Because you got to wait until like mid to late August when they go from green to that golden brown. Oh, man. And then you pop it in your mouth. It's so sweet and so tangy and juicy because it's finally ripe. That's what James is talking about. You try and harvest fruit before it's ripe and it's wasted. There's a ripening process that is a part of the deal. God himself can't profitably harvest fruit that hasn't ripened. And we're talking about what's going on in our lives. God knows when we're spiritually ready to receive the blessing that he wants to give for our profit and for his glory. There are things that just cannot be received yet just because we said, hey, I'm ready and I want it. I was thinking about it this week, you know, my dad, who's still alive, is a wonderful man and a man of good sound judgment. And I can really only think of, of one time as a father when his judgment missed the mark. He, uh, and, and, and I'm not judging him for it because mine missed the mark plenty of times. But when I was in first grade, I spent a lot of time with my dad when I was a little kid because my mom taught school and my dad worked in his pharmacy all the time. And there was no daycare when we were kids in the little town that I lived in. So I just went to the pharmacy with dad and that was my daycare when I was a preschooler. And, and so I spent a lot of time in the pharmacy and I'm sure my dad has extra jewels in his crown in heaven for putting up with me all the hours that I was there because I drove him crazy because there's so much cool stuff in the drugstore that a little kid wants. And high on the list was this display the very top shelf in the drugstore of Zippo lighters. And like every good American kid, I thought fire was the best. Like to make fire was a good thing. Even at six years old, oh, oh yeah, make fire. I begged my dad day after day after day for a Zippo lighter. And for the longest time, dad is like, no, you're not old enough. You don't need that. that you, you know, you'd burn yourself. You can't have that. I don't know what happened. Maybe dad hit his head that day. I don't know. But one day, in a lapse of judgment, he got tired of hearing me ask for it, and he gave me a Zippo lighter. A very bad choice. <laughs> I lit everything short of the house on fire. Everything you could light with a Zippo lighter, I, until I used up all the fuel in my Zippo lighter like the first day. Being a resourceful six-year-old, I knew where Dad had the little fluid that you could refill a lighter with. Is, I still remember to this day, six years old, we had just finished dinner. Everybody's still at the kitchen table. And I knew my Zippo was out of fuel. And I ran and got, they didn't know what I was doing. I got the stuff and I went to the kitchen sink and I, I got the little screw on the bottom unscrewed and I refilled my Zippo lighter and I wasn't paying attention. And I spilled lighter fluid all over myself. I didn't care. I was six years old. I put the screw back in. I just wanted to make fire. And I flipped that thing over. And let me tell you, I made fire. It only took one strike for my entire hand to be on fire. I'm 56 years old. I have never hurt as much as I did that night when I set my hand on fire. It was, it was badly burned. 
They thought they were going to have to graft skin and stuff. It was an awful, awful night and days that followed. All because of one thing. I kept asking for something that I wasn't ready for yet. And my dad, out of love for me, gave me something that I wasn't ready to receive and handle well yet. Even though we are convinced, I want to tell you when I was six years old, I was convinced I would have a better life with a Zippo lighter in my pocket. And for a little while, it felt like that was true. Until I had the experience that was a very painful reminder that dad does know best. God knows when we're ready for the things that we are convinced that we need today. And sometimes for reasons that we will never understand, God is waiting until our hearts are right or whatever else that we can't see is ready for us to receive what he wants to give. I love how a classic writer in describing what we're talking about today put it. He said, speaking of having to wait on God for the things that we think we need right now, he said this, waiting in the sunshine of God's love will ripen the soul for his blessing. When you are convinced that the father that you're waiting on to come through, that he loves you and he's going to do what's best, that that will ripen your soul as you wait. He put it another way. He said, also when you're waiting under a cloud of trial and trouble, you can know that it will in time break into showers of blessings. So whether you feel like you're waiting in the sunshine of God's love or you're waiting under the dark cloud of difficulty, you can know that God will cause even that cloud to break forth in a shower of blessing. But you can rest assured that if you're having to wait longer than you wished to or wanted to, it's going to make it that much sweeter when God comes through and lavishes on you what you need. I think about when I, as a young man, recognized that God was calling me into vocational ministry, that God was calling me to be a pastor. I first started having a keen awareness of this when I was 16. And by the time I was 20, I had wrestled for four years with whether I would do ministry or medicine. And at the age of 20, surrendered fully to the call of God to ministry and began to pursue that and do the stuff educationally and in terms of training and stuff for that. And so in my mind, I assumed that that would come together pretty quickly. God, if you're calling me to be a pastor, and there was a strong sense of call toward that, well, surely when I get this process going and I start getting the training and the schooling for that, surely that'll be the thing that you'll turn me loose to do with no idea that it would be 12 years from the time that I surrendered to that calling until the first day that I ever pastored. <laughs> Nor how humble those beginnings would be, that it would be uh, first pastoring in a little bar, a daycare facility with just a little crude setting and just kind of a ragtag group of people thrown together trying to figure out how to do church. No idea it would take 12 years and wondering so many times along the way, like, God, I'm ready. Say yes, give me the opportunity. And even when God gave me the opportunity and he pulled the trigger on the starting gun 12 years later at 32, and I'm just like, God, I'm so gung-ho, I'll do anything for you. Just send the people. And I remember scratching my head for years going, where are all the people? We got chairs. I'm fired up. I'll preach the word of God. I'll love these people. God, I'll go anywhere you want me to go. Just send the people. And I remember just being perplexed. God, why don't you send more people? Why, why don't you make this thing happen bigger? Like what I think it's supposed to be doing. Not understanding quite yet, but God showing me over time. There's some fruit that's not quite ripe yet. And only with the passing of time and as God began to send more and more and more people did I begin to understand God was having to grow me to a place that he could entrust anybody to my care as a shepherd. <laughs> like looking back on it, I think, why did you ever send anybody to me when I was 32 and didn't have a clue? There's a ripening process and God's timing is always right. The second thing that we'll say, and we don't have to camp on this, is 
as to why we wait. The, the delay is also teaching us that the giver is better than the gift. And this is really what we talked about last week. We don't have to rehearse this again. Just the surprise we discover in waiting is that God is our great reward. That a fresh revelation of more of himself is the most satisfying thing we experience. More than the, the benefits and the blessings that we were seeking. That's the conclusion of, of the key verse for today. Blessed are those who wait for him. Why? Because they get to experience more of him. You know, we don't know a great deal about royalty in this country because we're a republic and we've never had a monarchy. But we are enamored with the British monarchy and, and sort of with royalty in general now. I mean, like, do you notice a week ago what a big deal the uh, American media and everybody made about um, Norwegian royalty, the uh, the daughter of King Harold married this shyster American, this shaman. Did y'all follow that story? It's a weird story. But Americans are enamored because it's a princess marrying an American. We're, we're so enamored with the idea of the monarchy. And one of the things that we discover is that queens and princesses always have ladies in waiting. That's not a very happy-sounding term, is it? A, a lady-in-waiting, the thing we don't like to do. But a lady-in-waiting is one of the highest honors that a person can have, even though it's a position of service, of, of, of being submissive to the queen or to the princess. It's such a high position of privilege because the monarch or the future monarch has said, I choose you to be my closest confidant and closest friends by calling you a lady in waiting. Friends, it is an incredibly high honor when the everlasting God chooses us to be ladies and men in waiting, sons and daughters in waiting, because even as we are waiting, for particular outcomes and solutions and for resources and help, even as we are waiting, God says, the, the waiting is the joy because I invite you to the privilege of being my close companions. That is just almost unthinkable, isn't it? That the king of kings says, come and be my close companion. Lamentation 325 says this, the Lord is good to those who wait on him. Now I want to conclude with one last thought. We read the story of the wayward son and his return to the father and, and all that's lavished on him. But the thing that occurs to me is that while plenty of us can say, yep, been there where the boy went, demanding to live life on my own terms, the reality is there are plenty of people in a church setting who don't so much identify with that and who still sort of scratch their heads at a message like this going, I haven't lived like a hellion. Spent my whole life in church. I've tried to live an honorable life. But I don't really feel the nearness of God in some big way in my life. I don't particularly see the anointing and blessing and favor of God on my life. What's the deal? And for those of us that that would be our response or our confusion, Jesus didn't end the story where I stopped reading. Let's read the rest of the story, beginning in verse 25. Remember, there was an older brother. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field, and when he came near the house, he heard music and dancing, so he called one of his servants and asked him what was going on. Your brother has come, he replied, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. And the older brother became angry and refused to go in. So that his father went out and pleaded with him, but he answered his father, Look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeying your orders, yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours, who has squandered your property with prostitutes, comes home, you kill the fattened calf for him. My son, the father says, you are always with me, and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad, because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. 
so striking that Jesus would include this second part to the story. Oh, there's another son who lived his life a very different way. He never openly rebelled against the dad. He never went out and lived the wild life that other people would judge. And in fact, what we discover is he just sat home doing the right stuff with a judgmental attitude. In fact, it killed him to see his bad black sheep little brother come home and receive such a royal welcome. It chapped him horribly to see not only did dad receive him back, even though he already spent his part of the inheritance, he's throwing a party for it. It's not fair. It's not fair. That's not even the real tragedy of the story. The most tragic part of the story is this older son who by all outward appearances had lived his life right, had done the honorable thing, stayed with his dad, served his dad, did the right stuff, and yet he lived his entire life cut off from the joy of his father. And he makes that clear. He's so frustrated because he sees, I have never enjoyed with you what my wayward hellion brother has with you the moment that he comes back. I never experience the joy of celebration. In fact, I never really feel joy in my relationship with you. I've been slaving for you. And I'm not happy. That's the unspoken message. I don't like where I am in life. I'm doing the right thing, and I ain't happy doing it. What do you think Jesus was trying to say in that? It doesn't take a very bright person to figure that out, does it? There are plenty of people, plenty of people, who have lived good lives, they've gone to church, read their Bibles, said their prayers, gave their offering, and they are cut off from the joy of the Father's house. Well, they go to God's house all the time, and they know nothing of the joy or lavish blessing of the Father and of intimate fellowship with Him. Because deep in our hearts, we've carried this attitude of, God, what is the deal? Spent my whole life slaving, serving you. And I don't see any big blessing from it. I don't feel any great sense of your love and presence in my life. In fact, I'm starting to feel some resentment because I don't feel loved. What the older son didn't grasp is that God does not do transactional relationships. And that's how he thought. If I do all of these things for you, Dad, then I should be blessed for that. And that never works out with God. God relates out of a heart of grace. Grace means you're getting what you don't deserve. Grace is what you get when you humble yourself. You remember that basic truth that we see again and again in Scripture? That God resists the proud but he gives grace to the humble. It doesn't matter how jacked up you are when you humble yourself and you come back and say, I don't even deserve to be called your child. That's when God comes running and goes, I know, but you are. And I am so glad that you're mine. And I just can't wait to lavish more things on you. But as long as we have a self-righteous attitude and it's like, I've gone to church, why haven't you blessed me more? I've been a good person, God. Why haven't you made me feel you more? Why haven't you taken care of all of these things that I need? God does not do transactional relationships. God doesn't do quid pro quo. He is a God of, and Father of love and grace. He gives what isn't deserved to those who absolutely deserve it least and who recognize that and in a place of desperation just go, I know I don't deserve it. But I do believe you're my father. And I'll just open myself to receive whatever. <laughs> and when that happens, oh, when that happens, stand back and watch. Just hide and watch. Because when a waiting soul and a waiting God meet each other, a flood of blessing is released every time. I have a feeling there are a couple of different groups of people in the room who are well represented by the story we consider today. Some who have felt cut off from God because of how screwed up we've lived and how many times and ways we've tried to live by our own rules and we feel like that's disqualified us from the love and blessing of God. 
And isn't it good to know that God just wants to bless your socks off? There are others of us who feel just as cut off but more perplexed. Because we've been going to church, reading our Bibles, being good citizens. And still so, so, so perplexed by why we don't feel more of the nearness of God and see more of the favor of God in our lives. The truth of the matter is the Father loves both kinds of children. Both have the same need, and that is to humble ourselves in desperation, reaching out for what we don't deserve, but trusting in the heart of a good father to just pour out what is undeserved, and that's grace. Would you join me as we just bow before him in his presence? Just in this quiet moment, I want to ask you just a, a simple question or two. What do you think God feels or sees when he looks at you? I mean, the heart of the question is this. What does God think of you? How does God feel toward you? I want you to just wrestle with that for a moment. Does he feel disappointment? Does he feel anger? Does he feel sadness? What do you think he feels? And I want to assure you of this on the authority of God's word. What God feels when he looks at you is an overflowing sense of love and joy because he made you. He made you for himself and he loves you. And he wants you to know the joy of his house, the joy of his favor. He is the father who has been waiting, waiting for the day, waiting for the moment that he sees you make that turn toward him. You don't have to prepare for that moment. And I'm not trying to manipulate you, but I know in my spirit there are some of us today who desperately need to turn toward the Father today. Maybe you've been living life on your own terms. Maybe you've been trying to operate within a religious system as your way of deserving the favor of God. I just want to invite us together to do the same thing, and that is to just turn toward the Father and just receive grace. God, I, I, I don't want to do this. I don't want to live life on my own terms. I don't want to let church or religion define me. I want to know the joy living in intimate fellowship with you. Well, if that's the desire of your heart, would you just tell him that just in this quiet moment? Just admit, God, I, I don't even control my own heart, it seems like. Help me to turn my heart toward you. Help me to believe that you love me the way that you do. Help me to take the first steps toward you. Would you let your mind's eye see you be the son that's walking toward the Father? And would you see your Father just break into a run toward you? Let your mind see him wrapping you up and receiving you, hugging you, kissing you, declaring his love for you. He's calling you by name. Hear him calling for the very best robe for you. He wants shoes on your feet. He wants a ring on your finger to show the whole world, that's my daughter, that's my son. Kill the fattened calf. We're going to celebrate tonight. Father, we don't deserve it, but we open our hearts to receive it. Would you come in and fill the aching longing in our souls with your very presence? Thank you for your love. Thank you for your nearness. I pray that you'd do a healing work among us here today in hearts that are hurting, who need to feel your nearness today. We welcome you and we pray this, Jesus, in your name. Amen. Thanks so much for tuning in today. I surely hope that what you heard was relevant and helpful and above everything. I hope that what you experienced today really helped your heart to connect with the heart of God. Now, if what you heard uh, for you stirred up any questions or maybe led you toward 
uh, some type of spiritual decision. Maybe you want to talk with someone about something that's on your mind. I would love to hear from you. And so I would encourage you, reach out by email. At the bottom of the screen, you see my email address. It's mark at myfreedomchurch.net. That's not going to go to a secretary or an assistant. That will come directly to me. I'd love to hear from you and talk with you about anything that's on your mind. And if in the future you're in our area, we would love for you to come and worship with us at Freedom Church. But until then, we invite you to access all of the sermon material that you find online. Again, thanks so much for taking the time to join us today. Hope that you have a great day.